Great. So I wanted to kick um, off today by giving you a quick update on a few of our key markets. So as you're no doubt aware, the US continues to see significant disruption due to COVID-19, which has resulted in some states reintroducing lockdown measures. This photo here is a perfect example of the social distancing rules not being followed at a restaurant. So with some states seeing behaviour like this, it is unsurprising that they are seeing increases in COVID cases. Unfortunately, food service um, provides a prime opportunity for the virus to spread. A recent study by the bank JP Morgan analysed 30 million credit card transactions and showed a correlation between increasing COVID cases and the number of transactions that occurred at restaurants. Looking at Europe, uh, Europe is beginning to see a decline in COVID cases, but they're still seeing around 15,000 new cases a day. Again, restaurants are open, but with social distancing rules being adhered to, as this photo from Italy last week shows. The challenge for Europe will be that with so many new cases and the holiday season starting, there is, there is a potential for the virus to reassert itself. Reese spoke last week about China, which is now back to normal, or the new normal. Uh, this photo was taken last week in Wuhan and shows diners Diners returning back to restaurants. The challenge COVID has created for our industry is that New Zealand venison has been positioned as a premium food service product. And with the closure of the and the restrictions on the food service sector, this means a key channel is not operating as it normally would. But this is going to be a short term thing. Restaurants are in the business of bringing people together and creating unique experiences for them. It's not something that we can replicate at home. In a recent US survey, it was conducted at the beginning of June, 40% of respondents said that visiting a restaurant was the first thing they were looking forward to doing post lockdown restrictions. So with food service under pressure at the moment, the Venus and marketing companies have been looking at new retail and manufacturing opportunities. And we've been working to support their change in target market. One of the key ways that DIN supports companies is through the Joint Promotion Fund. This supports companies and their import partners to undertake marketing activities. This year, DINs has increased the funding available to nearly half a million dollars. This has resulted in several new initiatives from companies, including the exploration of new online and direct-to-consumer channels in New Zealand and Australia, retail promotional activities in Europe and New Zealand, as well as expanded digital promotional activities in the US and Europe. Two examples of projects that have received funding are the Alliance Instagram competition, which they have recently been running in North America, and Mountain Rivers continued cooperation with, Swedish, with the Swedish Instagrammer. Look out for the October issue of Dear Industry News. We will be having a feature that will highlight some of the other programs that have benefited from this funding. Now, Obviously, our chefs were not able to get out and about during lockdown either. So we set Shannon Campbell and Graham Brown to work developing new resources. With the increase in online promotional activities, companies are always on the lookout for new content. So we wanted to have a suite of new material ready for when food service opens up, along with some more consumer-friendly recipes. Shannon is focused on creating a lot of short Instagram hands and pan style videos while Graham has done more instructional recipe-based um, based videos, which focused on family-friendly recipes. We're just in the final stages of editing these before they se get sent out to the companies. Shannon has also been creating a few new recipes for us, focusing on cuisine styles that are becoming more and more popular in Europe, such as Japanese street food, Middle Eastern food, along with more mince-based recipes as we see more mints on grocery store shelves. I also had the wonderful Nikki Aswood, who was profiled in Deer Industry News recently, create some new images for companies to use on their social media channels. We're also very lucky that in recent weeks, Shannon has been able to go out and work with individual restaurants. The program we have been running has seen key restaurants identified in conjunction with importers. We have then approached the restaurants and Shannon has spent a day with the chef, creating a number of venison dishes that work with their menu and their style of cuisine. 
Shaman takes his photography equipment and captures these fantastic images, which, along with the recipes, are then shared with the restaurant and the importers and their wholesalers for them to use on their social media channels. This exercise has really reinforced to me that chefs love our product. <clears throat> All of the chefs that were approached were excited to take up the opportunity to work, excuse me, to work with Shannon. If they weren't fans of the products before, they certainly were afterwards, after seeing how they can use New Zealand venison in different ways to how they use European game. Something this photo, which is one of my favourites, really demonstrates with the chef creating a venison pate and cured venison, things that you definitely wouldn't be doing with European game. So looking to the game season, in addition to Din's regular um, work, supporting importers with sales calls and chef workshops, we are currently developing some promotional activities that will be targeted towards consumers. With experts predicting that social distancing measures will probably still be in place in Europe by October, <clears throat> there will continue to be more of a focus on home cooking. So it is important to be undertaking some work targeted at, at this market. Looking to the US, our big focus there has really been looking at the opportunities that exist for New Zealand venison in the meal kit space. Now, I'm not gonna bore you with the numbers, but this is a sector that has seen huge increases in customers over the last few months. And this growth is only predicted to continue over the next few years. Part of this is driven by consumers that normally wouldn't have tried uh, a meal delivery under normal circumstances, um, doing so during lockdown and finding actually it was very convenient and of a really high quality. <clears throat> We're focused on identifying opportunities where New Zealand venison can add a point of uniqueness um, that will be valued by a company and their customers. Now, this isn't a short-term fix, um, but is more looking at the medium term to help us continue to diversify our markets. Now, lastly, I want to talk about some of the exciting stuff happening up in China. <clears throat> you might have read that we've been undertaking some, some research, and I wanted to play part of an interview with a chef that we did as part of the research. I today did a lot of the vegetables, <laughs> 然后还有金菜也可能也比较也比较适合So one of the key things this research project was trying to ascertain is for Chinese consumers, which of the Chinese cooking styles is most suited for venison? Nearly all of the chefs we talked with highlighted both Lu and Sichuan cuisine as being the most suitable. The challenge we have here is for us to show them how to adapt the traditional recipes with venison and to leave enough room for the unique flavor of venison to shine, shine through. The other thing uh, that this research reconfirmed is that Chinese chefs really don't know how to cook venison and often try and treat it as they do beef or lamb. So there is still a big educational piece for us to work on. So we have a lot of work happening up in China and I'm really keen for us to keep the foot on the accelerator with this stuff. We're in the midst of developing an appropriate logo website and the educational material I spoke about, which will include some specific things for Chinese social media platforms. We have a workshop planned with New Zealand uh, Trade and Enterprise that will be held in Shanghai in the next few months, and this will focus on high-end and innovative chefs. We're also looking to further um, explore venison's application in the Sichuan cuisine, as we've identified it being a potentially a great market. The other project that we are looking at is whether there are any Chinese um, ha perceived health benefits for venison. Now, it's not in the same traditional Chinese medicine space as velvet, 
but we're sort of thinking it might be traditional Chinese medicine adjacent. So we just want to explore what that means and see if this opens up any potential markets for us. Thanks. Traditionally at the Deer Industry Conference, this particular section is always after lunch and uh, <laughs> I can see why because every year the videos get better and better about what's going on marketing uh, some of the most beautiful meat in the world and I just remember then that I've forgotten to have lunch. Oh, absolutely stunning. Thank you so much Nick Taylor for that presentation. Now of course it's time to uh, go to our marketers. We are joined on the line live to take yours and my questions live. Please don't be shy. We They want to hear from you and uh, this is always a very active part of the industry, Dare Industry Conference every year. In the YouTube below, put your comments in the chat. I can see it here open. If you're watching on Facebook, put it in the comments as well. We've got plenty of time through to two o'clock. Uh, so we've got a lot to cover and feel free to ask any questions. If you could please put who you'd like me to refer that question to that would help as well. I do have a series of questions here uh, that we can kick off and get that underway. So Joel, if you wouldn't mind, I'll just do a wee bit of a whip round uh, to quickly introduce who we have on the line. Now, uh, kicking off, Glenn McClellan uh, is the China Market Account Manager for Silver Fern Farms. Of course, John Sadler is familiar to you all as manager of uh, Mountain River Venison. Uh, Tony Frost is the GM for Venison uh, Sales and Supply for First Light Foods. Uh, Terry O'Connell is the Marketing Manager for Alliance Group. And Jared Sandry is the Marketing and Logistics Manager for Duncan New Zealand Venison. So we'll have a question wrapped around to each of them first to kick it off uh, and then of course I'd like whilst you get your questions in as well. This question first is for Glenn. Now Glenn have you seen significant changes in New Zealand's retail venison sales during lockdown and post lockdown? Um, yeah we've been working hard to extend sort of the the range that we sell into and the New Zealand retail has been a key part of that. Um, and the retail sector has been challenging for venison due to the lack of knowledge around how products are cooked. Um, but I believe prior to, to lockdown, uh, we've successfully marketed our branded retail packs in New Zealand. Um, and that's been so successful that we're actually um, expanding that to launch into the US. Um, but we saw a good trend over lockdown was a move to home cooking, uh, given that people aren't able to go out and about. Um, so to follow on from that, we're actually running some promotions um, over the next little while into the, the main season uh, and we'll use that to uh, encourage some more of that consumer demand uh, and look forward to this home cooking trend continuing to develop. John, the challenges in Europe have been very real. Um, can you give us an example of how your partners have identified these new opportunities within their domestic markets uh, in developing new products to fit into that particular European market? Yeah, um, the challenges certainly keep coming and um, we're faced with uh, trying to move more product into retail because food service is so seriously disrupted and um, I think we all see that continuing through this season. Um, the challenge with retail is that mostly that's chilled product. And uh, so it's much easier to, to retail, sell a chilled product in retail. Um, having said that, chilled is becoming more challenging because uh, the, the transit times to Europe for the sea freight vessels is longer and the cost of air freight's gone up. So we've worked with our partner in, in Europe to develop some chilled retail products, um, marinating frozen product uh, and thawing it and selling it as retail. Um, and they develop a few products uh, with um, chili type rubs, um, herbs, and uh, at the moment for the summer, they're offering those uh, as grilling items to go on the barbecue. And um, those sort of innovations are going to be the way that we'll be able to sell more at retail and solve in part at least the problem of uh, the logistical problem of getting chilled product over to Europe.
Mm. Tony, the interruptions in the US have been considerable and First Light have got a sales manager based on the ground there in the States. How is that role uh, going significantly post-COVID and the importance of having somebody on the ground? Yeah. Through, through COVID-19, we saw um, extreme benefit in, in our investment in the North American retail market and, and certainly having those resources, you know, now a team of five up there um, is the answer to sort of maintaining and, and through COVID seeing increased actual growth um, in that retail space. Our challenge remains that um, venison, you know, uh, remains a very small quantity in retail. Um, and as both Glenn and, and John have alluded to, you know, retail is just not an easy challenge or solution for venison overnight. You know, it is a um, strategic planned, um, mapped out, you know, um, strategy that we've, we've got to work on to actually get the consumers used to eating venison in retail and accepting of it in that form. You know, we, how we, you know we've got sufficient confidence that that's going to continue and we're really keen to invest in that channel, especially in the US um, and with the support that we've got up there. And I think, you know, for us, um, you know, how and, how and why will we do that? Um, you know, similar to our other experiences in other markets, you know, where venison was not well known, you know, we're going to build the awareness um, with the lower value convenience products and really get consumers on board with that and then focus on, on lifting that spend as we, um, as, you know, that, that increases and that awareness grows. So that process with our staff and with, with you know, the new resources up there is well underway, um, as the others would, would support too, you know, Silver Fern with their range. It doesn't happen overnight. There's a lot of planning and, and, and work that must go on for products to be accepted into retail and to get them onto that shelf. Um, so that's well underway and we're looking um, at launching those within the next six months. Terry, what challenges has pivoting to more consumer focus created for Alliance and for your partners? Well, firstly, thanks for the opportunity to say a few words. Uh, this topic is rather broad, so I've made a few notes to ensure I don't go off piece and still remain within the two-minute time slot. The main challenge is truly understanding the motivation and needs of the modern-day, multi-aged protein consumer in various cultures. We're determined to understand that core group better, but it remains a work in progress, which requires considerable research and effort to really understand and derive insight. Now, this approach also takes an increased level of resource and infrastructure to meet a heightened level of demand for delivering a high quality product and service. Specifically relevant is the traceability and supply chain story. As consumers are becoming more cognizant of where products are coming from and the backstory, this will be magnified in a post-COVID marketplace. What assistance do we need from our suppliers? Transacting further up the value chain requires an increased level of forecasting and planning to align supply with market demand, importantly committing to longer term supply arrangements with a volume underpinning the partnership to provide consistency and continuity of supply. Just an example of some of the projects we have underway, we've got action in various markets, but one of the most promising is the work we're doing in the UK with a group of chefs and their requirement for a high quality protein option, which is coupled with convenience. The solution is developing and enhancing the sous vide range to meet this need. It's taking time for their customer, this customer to fully understand the protein and the proposition, but we're fully focused on the task at hand and making solid progress. Just to finish, I'd like to say Alliance Group remains fully committed to the venison category. We continue to work on increasing value for this magnificent protein. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, Jared, uh, with challenges in your existing markets, what has Duncan been doing to identify new markets and opportunities? Um, yeah, it's been very challenging. Um, coronavirus has been a worldwide pandemic, so it has affected all markets, just not one or two. Um, so with that, there's been limited chance to sort of identify new markets. Um, so with that, we've just focused on the New Zealand market. Um, we looked at way how people adapted their shopping uh, habits and trends, um, and a lot of that was purchasing food online. Um, so with that, we've partnered up with a couple of companies like Container Door and Grab One um, to reach out to the New Zealand, New Zealand consum consumers. Um, and it also helped that a lot of people are looking out supporting local produce and companies 
um, so that made them actively look out for New Zealand source proteins, um, which has been great over the, the COVID lockdown. Fantastic. I've got a couple of questions coming in here from some viewers uh, as well as a few more of my own. Bill Robinson um, would like to know, uh, I suppose just put your hand up if you could, um, did, did any of these companies use couriers during lockdown and have trouble with the deliveries not arriving in fit state? Um, it, this is of course with e-commerce um, and that's why a lot of people weren't game to use it. Uh, can someone take that question? Yeah, I can jump in. Yep. Um, yeah, we had a lot of our products sent out on couriers, uh, especially through Container Door and Grab One. Um, and we were lucky enough that they sort of advised flexible shipping dates. Um, so it wasn't to be delivered on a certain time. However, there was still half a dozen or a dozen so uh, cartons that did get lost in the couriers, um, which was just replaced directly um, and as soon as possible. So. There was some hiccups, but from us, our side, we didn't actually work, weren't affected that bad. Mm. How did you find it, Tony? Sorry, uh, we had a, we had a bit of experience in America, and I think generally um, it went very, very well. Um, as you can imagine, um, you know, couriers were in hot demand, and so their workloads had, you know, gone from, you know, quadruple, ten times over um, with the volume, and so generally very much similar to Jared. Um, with the experience, yes, a couple went missing, but basically, you know, they were honoured and, and new ones sent um, pretty much straight away. Mm. Glenn, let's talk China. China's been rapidly becoming a very important market with a huge uh, reliance that we have on its trade. What markets and areas is Silvern Farms currently exploring? Um, we still continue our developments with China. Uh, so Venice had been showing huge promise uh, in, in China prior to the um, COVID-19 um, until Demet somehow found itself on the uh, the banned list. So MPI has done some fantastic work in, in getting that um, resolved, although we're still seeing some, some barriers to entry into that market. Um, but as we overcome those, we see some huge opportunities within China, within the uh, food service processing sector. Uh, and we, we've even seen some good success moving into the pet food um, segment in the, the China market. Um, and outside of that, as I, I mentioned previously, we've expanded our retail range uh, into the US. Um, so Venison's a part of a range that we've launched there. And we're working with existing US retail partners, currently purchasing lamb and beef um, to leverage that relationship on other species and further develop uh, Venison into those categories. Um, so one, one of those good examples is that um, we're in the process of creating our own e-commerce platform in the US, uh, and so that's going to showcase a full range of, of products, including venison, um, and expect that to be operational later on this year. Mm. Of course, many viewers are farmers and uh, probably have one burning question, and it's of course what the spring schedule is going to look like. Um, I would probably want to fire this first over to John. Can you comment on, on where it's at and the flow down to the farm gate? Lucky me, eh? Um, oh, crikey, there's, there's so much going on out in the market. Food service is certainly disrupted, and that's, um, that's a big deal for the deer industry. I think that's already been covered, and that will unfortunately impact on the prospects for the chilled season. Um, we also have this drama around air freight, the cost of air freight, it's more than double and uh, shipping by sea freight it's every year it seems to get earlier and earlier that the last vessel leaves to europe so we need to find other options to that which is why i mentioned before about using frozen product to sell and retail and a little bit chilled um food service uh, for us us markets are a big big one and um you know it's it's not good news there and almost every day it's a little bit worse uh, so this year's going to be tough. Terry, Alliance, you just said, is very committed to the venison category. How are you feeling about prices um, to, the, to, to the farmers in spring? Yeah, look, it's a very good question, isn't it? And one that everybody wants an answer to. Look, this COVID thing's really put this in a tailspin. And um, I'm usually a generally optimistic person. Um, there's, you know, there's still some good chattery out there, but some of these key importers are... Uh, 
hesitant to engage because they're worried about a second wave of this COVID coming through and affecting food service again. So they've got the option of waiting and then going for the air freight. But as John mentioned, that's going to be prohibitive with the cost. So, yeah, it's a really difficult position we're in at the moment. But we're still confident there'll be a, a quite good demand for it, uh, for venison in the game season. But I think they'll like this just-in-time ordering. So, yes, so the sea freight might be limited, but they'll be trying to delay and, and see if we can get a better result with the air freight. Tony, I have a viewer question here I'm going to put to you. Uh, Grant Dick Dixon would like to know, do you see venison in the functional food space? Food is a fashion item with health properties. What are we doing in our messaging around that space? Absolutely. I think, um, especially on the healthy side of it, um, venison to me has huge potential in this space. Um, I think COVID sort of tends to disrupt things a bit. And so, you know, our whole focus now is going to different um, uh, platforms of being able to promote and, um, and grow those sales again. And, you know, if we look at venison, it, it's not a cheap protein and we don't want it to be. And this is where it does. It starts to play and lend itself on those emotive factors that those consumers are looking for to satisfy, and one of those being health. So I absolutely feel that this is this is a space that needs a lot of work going into. You know, DINs um, uh, in the last 12 months have put out some amazing promotional uh, brochures and, and um, material for us. And certainly I've been sharing that with a lot of my customers Um for their end customers and um, you know it's valuable valuable stuff but of course it's then having the right platform to sell those on so of course food service is going to be a struggle um, you know let's make no bones about it in the next 12 two years three years has even been mooted you know that maybe it's going to take that long for food service really to sort of get some traction again but it's not going to stop people wanting to eat and wanting wanting high value quality protein for a special occasion for you know as as we've talked about already today you know eating at home or cooking yourself or um you know being able to buy and enjoy on a different platform so yeah absolutely I have a question that I'm going to whip around as a way of closing come in from uh, Mark Harris and the question is I would like from you your number one learning from this pandemic and uh, paired with mine and the importance of diversification and assessing new markets potential. Uh, I'll kick off with you Glenn. Yeah very good question thereafter. A period of, of uncertainty um, but I think one of the biggest learnings is um, that we need to have a diverse range of sector options um, so while also that market diversification is important uh, within each market there's a, there's a whole range of sectors that we can access and the more we can learn about um, sales investigation into um, consumer behavior and uh, different channels um, the better we're going to be able to diversify our sales within those existing markets that are already familiar uh, with our fantastic venison story. Mm. Um, so that's, that's where we'll continue our focus. John? I'd say um, flexibility is probably something we've learned. Uh, we need to be flexible, change our products, change our markets, change how we ship the products to our markets. Um, yeah. You know, the guys at the factory are challenged because uh, some of them didn't have work after it. Some of them had to do more work and uh, just a whole lot of things around being flexible. Mm. Thierry? Yeah, look, I just echo John's comments there. You know, you've got to be light on your feet and, um, and be quite agile because that, this is a major event. You know, we've never seen anything in, in my certainly time in the meat industry of this nature. So... Yeah, it's taught us a few things, and uh, I guess agility is, is probably the main one. Hmm. Jared, how have you found found it as well? Yeah, I agree with everyone else. It's um, you know it's been very hard looking for new markets and diversification, especially when you can't travel and, and meet new people and talk to them. Um, so I guess just being flexible, and I guess you've just got to trust your customers as well, um, finding new ways of working with them um, in an existing environment. So. Not only do we have to learn new ways of working, but so do our customers. So 
it's just being supportive for them um, and making sure that they're on the other side of this uh, pandemic as well. And to you finally, Tony. I think uh, relationships and um, think outside the square. You know, here's a huge opportunity for us to, to power on forward and actually find a new pathway for venison in the future. And there is one. Mm. And I'd like to finally uh, he- have a wrap from Nick Taylor himself, hearing from the marketing panel there. Nick, what have you taken away from this very um, unprecedented time in marketing venison and what you've heard there from the panel? I think, um, as everyone has identified um, through the questions today, you know, it's been, it's been a challenging um, situation in a, in, a, in a whole range of markets and, you know, um, I guess it's a, an unprecedented um, event. Um, I think what it really underscores for me is the importance of some of the of the market diversification work that DINS has been undertaking um, recently. And I think that's, um, you know, through programs like P2P. And so as we are planning our activities into the future, it's thinking about how can we be supporting companies um, to undertake some of that, mar- you know, new market exploration and, and work in new markets, um, which is challenging and um, and takes time and, and, and energy and that. So, um, but I think, you know, as everyone's um, talked about this, this huge opportunity, everyone sees that huge opportunity. Um, we've got a fantastic story um, about the product and the provenance of the product and our fantastic farmers um, who are uh, um, supplying that. And so I think, look, we're, we're well placed to um, keep moving that story and taking that it out to the world. Yes, yeah, it will be a very interesting to time to hear what uh, where it looks in 12 months at the next, uh, the 2021 Deer Industry Conference. I want to thank all of our panellists uh, just then and from the Venus and Marketers around the country, all of our guest presentations over the last three sessions and of course the live Q&A from you, our viewers at home. Thank you so much for taking the time to participate in the Deer Industry's very first virtual conference sessions.